actually. So, yeah. Luke 15 is where we're going to be. Luke 15. Luke 15. We're finishing up a series this morning that we've been in in most of January called God Is. And in this series, we've been looking at how our confessional theology, what we believe, what we sing, what we proclaim, what we say we believe, how our confessional theology and our functional theology, how we live, how we respond, how we behave, oftentimes they're at two ends of the spectrum. What we confess about on Sunday morning, what we profess in our um, theology, what we say we believe is often not showing up in how we live our lives. Preparing for this series, I had three aims with three goals, hopes that I prayed you would receive through this series. The first was to communicate how our theology and our understanding of God um, and about who he is matters for everyday living. It's not enough to sing about God's goodness on a Sunday morning. Believing it affects every relationship we have with the people around us. Our beliefs affect us daily, and our actions show whether or not we be- what we believe makes a difference in our lives. The second aim was that I would that I would hope to see. The second aim was that I would hope that we would believe that God's word is sufficient for all of life. Sometimes we things like we think things like the Bible is really good for my spiritual life, or the Bible is really good for the times that we are at church. But friends, God's word is sufficient for every area of our lives. It affects us and is helpful for every aspect of our lives. It goes to the heart of everything, not just what we do on Sunday morning. And third, my prayer in this series is it would give us truths to stand on, truths that would free us from the weight of sin, from negative emotions, and the attacks of the enemy. By the way, these four truths are not something I just randomly came up with. They were first written by a guy named Tim Chester in a book called You Can Change, written way back in 2010. It's a good, good book for you to go through. Um, Maybe a book to go through with your wife or with a friend or even by yourself. It's a good resource. And at the end of each chapter, there's like this change project, some sin pattern or some negative emotion that you want to change. And it walks you through to understand who God is and how going through God's word helps to be a catalyst for that change. I went through it back in 2011, 2012, when uh, we were just starting here, and I realized that one of the truths that I didn't believe about God was that God was great. And so I had to be in control of everything. I was in control of everything. I think it's the DNA of church planters that we have to be in control. But there's a sin in that. There's an idol in that. Understanding these truths helped put more and more trust in God. And God has been really, really gracious to me, but it's a sin that I still struggle with nine years later. But God has done some amazing things through it. And last year, I was reading another book, and these truths came up again, and I ended up reading this book again, and that's where this series came out of. And so it's a great book. That's what it's called. You can get it on Amazon if you want to grow more deeper into it. But I hope that you've seen over the last four weeks that God has invited us as his children to know him. And not only that, but the invitation is that we are known by God for his glory and our good. And we won't get all this if we just want a few simple steps of, hey, how do I be a better Christian? Or a few tricks of the trade for our Christian walk. But we've got to sit in God's word. We've got to saturate ourselves deeply into who God is and what God has done. And in this series, we covered four truths about God that speaks to our heart. I almost call this series 4G because all four of these truths begin with the G, with the letter G. God is great. God is glorious. God is good. God is gracious. But 4G was yesterday, right? We're living in 5G and LTE. And so um, it was like, man, he's still talking about things from way back. And so, um, but these four truths, God is good. God is great. God is glorious. God is gracious. And today we're going to look at the last one, which I believe is the foundation for this entire series. Really the foundation that brings all of this together. We think of God's graciousness. 
We think, need to think about God's compassion, his mercy, his care, his steadfast love that flows from God to us. It's something that comes from God, not something that's earned, not something that's merited by anything we've done or anything we would do. But God is gracious because God is gracious. He's loving. He's kind. He's merciful. God's graciousness frees us from the enslavement of trying to prove ourselves to God and to others. And without understanding God's graciousness, the three other truths, God's greatness, God's gloriousness, God's goodness can actually be something that's not freeing at all, but it can actually be a weight that's added to our lives. Let me give you an example. A few weeks ago, we talked about um, the truth that God is glorious so we don't have to fear others. But without understanding God's grace in all these things, we will work really, really hard to fear God and get God's approval in a way that we'll be worried if we don't get God's approval. We'll say, I understand I don't need the approval of other people or I don't need to fear what other people think about me. I only need to fear what God thinks about me. And that's true. But I'll work really hard to make sure that God is happy with me all the time. Because God is glorious, I don't need to fear others. I only need to fear God. But when we fail, when we sin, we're crushed because we've let God down. We're crushed because what's God going to think of me now? See, without the grace of God covering all that, without his unmerited love, his mercy and kindness, his enjoyment of us, our lives will end up being one of legalism. Crushing, soul-crushing exhaustion. We will be trying to keep a standard to prove to God that we are lovable, that he needs to accept us. To prove to God that we deserve to know him. See, this truth is the most freeing truth because it enables us to simply enjoy and rest in all the other truths about God. But it's also the most scandalous truth because we're constantly born with this urge to prove ourselves. I'll give you an example. I, an example is my daughter, and she's in nursery, so I can pick on her. Um, my daughter's awesome. I love my daughter. But when she was younger, she lived for daddy's approval. She was a dad girl. When she was younger, she'll draw something or she'll do something, and then she'll want me to love it, right? And you could see the joy on her face when I smiled and when I approved it, but she was constantly working to gain my approval. It's not something I taught her. It was just something in her. And she would also get really heartbroken if daddy wasn't pleased with something that she did or something that she said. Man, I miss those days. <laughs> See, I need in those moments to remind my daughter, man, baby, I love you. No matter what you do, I love you. You have my approval as my daughter. You're mine. I might not approve all your actions. I, not, I not, might not approve all your behaviors, but I love you. You're my daughter. See, we're in this constant need of wanting to prove ourselves to other people or prove ourselves to God. And Jesus was scandalized for preaching this message of the grace of God. He was scandalized by the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees who used the law. They were people urging for God's approval to manipulate and to control people, to oppress them. And when Jesus comes and says that, hey, God is full of grace. God loves because God is love. The power was taken from these religious leaders, and they grew jealous, and they grew angry, and they grew bitter. It was a scandalous truth. In fact, this is the truth that the Apostle Paul would write about throughout all of his letters that he writes in the New Testament. You read the book of Romans and Galatians and Corinthians and Ephesians. All these were written to churches that were dealing with issues. And the primary issue that they were dealing with was that there is in these churches one group that was set up against another group. One group would say, you're not Christian enough. You're not doing it right. You're not proving yourself enough to Jesus. You don't pray enough. You don't fast enough. You don't give enough. You are not Christian. You look at the book of Romans and you get to the Gentiles, and then you got one Gentiles on one side, and you got Jews on the other side. And the Jews are saying, no, 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 you haven't done enough to prove your worth or prove that you belong. 
If you're really a Christian, then you need to do this and you need to do that. And the Gentiles are on the other side saying, man, you guys got it all wrong. They're fighting each other, trying to prove themselves worthy to each other. And then you get to the book of Galatians. And you have this heretical sect that comes in saying you need to be circumcised in order to prove yourself worthy. And Paul is writing about this because this is one of the hardest ones for us to rest in and to walk in. Because there's something in us that wants to prove ourselves to God, and there's something in us that wants to prove our worthiness to other people. So you shouldn't be surprised that this is something that we struggle grasping. And our desire to prove ourselves really comes in two ways. One is shame. And that comes when we realize we failed on some level or another. And we begin at that moment to think, I'm not worthy. I'm not good. God will not accept me. And so we try hard to make it up. But the other side is just as dangerous. And that's self-righteousness. It comes when we actually see that we think that we've proved ourselves, that we're good, that I'm better than them. I'm, I might have a struggle here, but at least I'm not like them. Maybe we proved ourselves better than the people around us. It shows itself in the treatment of others and in the expectations of what we should get because of our good behavior, what we deserve. See, these are the two types of people that Jesus encountered the most. And he uses these two types in one of his most famous parables that we just read about to show to show how only seeing God's graciousness on both sides, God's graciousness alone is the only thing that can free us to live the lives that God has called us to live. So we're in Luke 15. Luke 15 is a chapter that contains three parables. Our preaching cohort did a series on the parables back in August and September, and Dominique specifically spoke on this parable, and we're again looking at it this morning. If you remember from our series, a parable is a fictitious story that Jesus would tell to get to a point, to show a point, to prove a point. He'd be telling a story that, that would illustrate some truth about God and his kingdom. And so you get to Luke 15, Jesus is hanging out with sinners and tax collectors. He's hanging out with the worst folks in the community. He's hanging out with the lost. He's hanging out with the ones that, you know, that a good church person would never hang out with. That a good church person would question your salvation if they saw you hanging out with this group. And the Pharisees and the scribes, the religious leaders, the ones that are holding over this whole idea of proving yourself to others, they happen to end up on the scene. And they're fired up at who Jesus is hanging out with. And they're like, I can't believe this Jesus, this rabbi, this religious leader. Look at the folks that he's hanging out with. Look at the folks that he's sharing a meal with. Look at the folks that he's partying with. And Luke 15 begins with these words, the tax collectors and sinners were drawing near to Jesus to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes, they grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And so that sets up three parables. And Jesus in those, Jesus in, is with those, in these parables, Jesus says, I'm with those who consider themselves far from God. Jesus is with the sinners and the tax collectors, the really, really lost people. The ones you think, not sure that if they'll ever meet Jesus or know Jesus or love Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes show up and say, my goodness, why is he always hanging out with these people? And Jesus answering their critique of the company that he keeps with, he begins to share these three stories. The final one is the one we're going to look at today, but all three are meant to show that God is radically and passionately in pursuit of those who fear are far from him. And that God is radically and passionately in pursuit of those who think they're near to him, but they're not. The first two we're not going to get into focus on the lost, and the Pharisees are angry, that the, the lost that are Pharisees are angry about being near to Jesus. But the third one, the story of the prodigal son, deals with both sinners and the self-righteous. It's a story about two brothers. You might know this parable as the parable of the prodigal son. And in each of these brothers, we're going to see a pattern. We're going to see three things. We're going to see sin. We're going to see self-justification. We're going to see grace. Sin, self-justification, grace. So 
let's look at both of these brothers, and I'm just going to point some things out to you. Let's start with the younger brother. The sin in the younger brother's life was, that, was very visible. In the church world, the younger brother would be the one that we would be having prayer meetings for. He would be the one that we would say, man, he is lost. You could see how lost he is. He's in darkness. He's far from God. We need to get together, and we need to pray for him. We need to cast out some demons to get him back to church, right? Because that boy has issues. He's got the sin of license. He's got the scandalous outward sins that we're just like, whoa. We wouldn't be wrong to pray for him. You look at the story, and it starts off by saying that this guy goes to his dad, and he asks for his dad for his inheritance. And what he's telling his dad basically is, hey, give me my inheritance. And when he says that, he's basically saying, dad, you're dead to me. Just give me what's mine. I want to treat you as if you are dead. I want nothing to do with you. Now, this isn't like my kids who come to me on a daily basis and say, give me money, give me money, give me money. Um, this is, dad, you're dead. I don't want anything to do with you. I don't want anything to be associated with you. I'm, give me what's mine, and then I'm leaving. You're dead to me. This is a huge sin. The father had every right to say, you know what? Get out of here. The father had every right to kick him out. The father had every right to say, I disown you. And no one would fault the father for that. No one would be like, man, that dude was mean to his son. No one would. He had every right to say, get out of my house, never come back, I disown you. That's how much of a transgression this was. But he doesn't. He gives the son his portion of the inheritance. And it wasn't like he wrote his son a check or something. It wasn't like he wired some money into his bank account, but his inheritance was probably animals and land and probably a lot of money. He divides it all up and gives the younger son his portion. The son sells the land, sells the animals, and he heads out of the dad's home, not to be hurt for, for a while. He's gone. He's spending. He's living life large. He's spending money everywhere he can. You ever see a college student with a credit card for the first time? That's, that's, these guy. that's this guy. I'm speaking from experience as a college student with many, many credit cards. Here he is, and he's spending money. He's going to the club, and his friends get ready to pay for stuff. He's like, no, I'll put your money away. I got this. I'll take care of this. This is all on me. He's popular. Everyone wants to be around him. He's buying friendships by paying for things. You know, the person with the money is usually the popular one at the pop party scene until money runs out. Life is good. And then a famine rose. The economy crashed. The rainy day came. Remember what Dave Ramsey told us? Save money for a rainy day? This dude didn't listen to his dad. He surely didn't listen to Dave Ramsey. There was no money saved. He had spent all of it. He had lived a sinful, wasteful life. Not on money that he worked hard on or earned, but money that he took from his father. So there was no honor in using the inheritance for a legacy of his dad. He was using it all for himself. You read the story and his brother says, Man, he spent his money on prostitutes, living for himself, his own happiness. Famine rises. Everything's gone. Nothing's left. And he's forced to get a job feeding pigs. Remember the audience here. His audience were Pharisees and scribes who know that it's unlawful for a Jewish person to touch pigs. And so what Jesus is saying in the story is illustrating that this guy has hit rock bottom. There's nowhere else to go. You cannot get lower than this. He's working, feeding pigs. He called his father dead. He spent all of his father's money, and now he has no money. And now he's going to go risk being unclean to make himself a living. And not only that, he gets to the point that he's so hungry that he looks at what the pigs are eating and is like, man, that looks really, really good. That must be tasty. It must be full of vitamin C. And now he's longing to eat what the pigs are eating. It can't get worse. And Jesus is emphasizing how messed up this guy was, how rock bottom this guy hit, and rock bottom brings him to a place of brokenness. Sitting there around the pigs, he realizes that I need to go home. I need to get back to my dad's house. And so he comes up with the script that he's going to say to his dad. He's got this whole thing written out. He's got this memorized, Dad, I'm no longer a son, but would you at least take me back as a servant? Notice the shame and the penance of this younger brother. He knew he messed up. He knew he hit rock bottom, but he woke up. Some of you have lived lives with the younger brother. 
there's a moment you wake up with kind of like a headache, a little blurry after Saturday night, and you're like, I don't ever want to do that again. And that was awful. Never going to do that again. You come to yourself and like, man, I don't want to live this life. And now, without the Holy Spirit, that conviction will last about five days till like the following Friday, right? And then you're like back in that same pattern again. He's like, I don't want to be eating with the pigs. The servants that work for my dad, they eat better than I do. And he's ashamed. Listen to his thought process here. I'm going to go home. I'm going to be a servant. I will prove myself to my dad. I will make it up. I'm going to go and I'm going to work for him so he will see how sorry I really am. And he's thinking, how do I make it up to my dad? How can I show him? How can I make it up to dad here to show him that I'm really sorry for what I've done? We can relate. We think to ourselves, how do you make it up when you mess up, right? You're a husband, you get into a fight, and you know where the flowers are at Costco, right? You're aware of our own failures and our sin against God, and we're quick to figure out how we can make it up. We're quick to figure out how to make it right. We're humbled, but we're not really humble. We're humbled, but not really humble. We're ashamed of our actions. We're like the younger brother. We're proud enough to believe that somehow we can make it up ourselves. That we're good enough to say, God, I will bring you something to make this up. He even had the right script memorized. Probably practiced it all the way back home. Dad, I'm not worthy. He probably believed this. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to be a son. Would you just make me your servant? And what he, what he was expecting to happen doesn't happen. In fact, the opposite of what he was expecting happened. Look at verse 20. So he got up and he went, with his fa- went to his father And while the son was still a long way off, the father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told the servants, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his fingers and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened cow and slaughter it. Let's celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and is alive now. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. Notice, we saw the sin of the son, but notice the love of the father. The son is coming down the road, broken, beaten up, broke, and he's coming down the road thinking, okay, i got to say this to my dad. Father, I'm not worthy to be here. I'm sinned against you. I've sinned against heaven. I, did you just make me your servant? Can I get, just get a job in your home and just you can feed me for the work I do? He's reciting this on the road. And where's the father in all this? He's looking out for the son. He was looking out at a distance at the son. He didn't know he was coming back. He didn't probably didn't have a phone plan and didn't get a text saying, hey, Dad, I'm coming home. Dad had no idea that the son was returning. But the father was longing, anticipating, waiting for the son to come. And as the son recites the script over and over, he's thinking through what he's going to say. And it says that the dad made a sprint toward the son. And this, too, for the Pharisees to hear, A wealthy older man doesn't run. It's not proper etiquette. It's not respectable. And the point is, man, grace motivated this. Love motivated this. Love motivated the father. He doesn't just care anymore. He just ran because he saw his son. Why is Jesus saying this? Because Jesus is showing us in this that God's grace doesn't end. It doesn't give up. It doesn't quit. It doesn't run out of time. It doesn't say that you've messed up one too many times. You're done. God is not, the God is not done with you. God's grace does not give up on you. And maybe you're here this morning, you say, I messed up really big. The God does not deserve to bless me. You're right. He doesn't, but he does anyway. Maybe you're saying, I, don't, I shouldn't be at church. I don't want to pray. God's done. He's gotten fed up by now because I messed up over and over. I've used all my chances with God. There are no more get out of hell free cards with God anymore. And Jesus is showing us that the Father, our Father in heaven is just watching, just watching, and he's willing to run towards you. And as we come back broken, he meets us not just halfway. He meets us right where we are. He runs, friends, to us. Obviously, the younger son doesn't expect this, and he begins his script. He's like, here we go, and he gets halfway through it. 
He doesn't get to the part where he says, hey, let me be your servant, because the dad is hugging him and kissing him and crying and moved with compassion for his son. And he gets halfway through the script, and God, dad's like, no, 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 no. And then he turns to his servant and says, hey, hey, go, come here. And he gets the robe, get the ring, get, get the fattened cow. We're going to party. We're going to celebrate tonight. He's saying, get all the symbols that indicate that this boy is my son, that he's mine. These are the things that mark him as my son. He's my family. He doesn't let the son do his script. He never lets the son say, I'm not worthy to be your son. I want to be your servant. No, no, you are my son. He doesn't say, hey, what did you do with the money? You spent it, didn't you? I can only imagine what you did out there. Let's get into our house. Your mom's worried about you. We'll talk about this later. He doesn't do that. No, he sees the son's brokenness. He sees the son's weakness. He has compassion. He has love. He says, I'm here. Let's go. Let's go celebrate. Whatever happened, happened. Doesn't matter anymore. You were dead, but now you're back. You're alive. You're my son. It's over with. Let's party. Let's celebrate. He doesn't even say, you know, I would throw you a party, but your inheritance, um, you spent it. So there's really no money left for you. This, um, I can't do anything. But the father goes, no, go get the fattened cow. This is like, get the prime rib dinner at the most expensive restaurant in the city because we're going to party, party and I'm going to spend my money. There is no price that I'm not willing to pay because my son has come back. He doesn't say, no, 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 we're not spending any more money. You just spent half of it. No, he says, we're partying because you're more important to me than any amount of money that I spent. Friends, the son doesn't deserve this. He hasn't done anything but tell his dad that he wished he was dead and spent the money that the dad worked hard for. The son was broken and returned, and the father meets him, loves him. What do we learn about the younger son? Three things. Number one, no matter how far we feel we have run from God, God's grace will meet us where we are. Maybe you're here this morning, you feel like you're running from God. The cool thing about God's grace is that when you're broken and you get to the place of where the younger brother was of brokenness, the minute that you turn to Jesus, you know where he is? He's right there. There are no other steps that you have to take. There are no other things that you have to do. The father looked off in the distance, saw the son, and it says the father ran. He didn't say, no, you know what, I'm just going to sit here and make him come. I want to see him cry. I want to see if this repentance is genuine repentance. I'm going to make him work for it. He doesn't do that. The father says, I'm here. You're mine. Friends, you are never too far from God. Never. Maybe you're here this morning, you're like, I haven't felt close to God. Can I tell you that God has never left you? He's always there. The moment you turn, he's there. Number two, shame and pride will cause us to seek to make it up to God. Our pride will make us think that our sin was so grievous that we'll override God's grace. But friends, that's pride. To think that you can do something to dismiss the total character of God it will cause us to seek and make it up on our own. We think like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read my Bible every day. I'm going to go to church every Sunday. I'll go to every church thing there is, Sunday morning, MTG, Bible study, um, Super Bowl party at Dean's house. I'll be everywhere. I'll be volunteering kids' church. I'll listen to only Christian music for a week. I'll avoid R-rated movies. And when you're doing stuff like that, friends, that's not out of a place of love. It can be. But when you're doing stuff like that, you're basically saying, God, let me prove to you my worth. I'm going to prove how good I am to you. I want to make up my old life. And you can't do that. Shame and pride will cause us to think that we something we could do for God to accept us. The third thing I want you to see, grace is not earned. Our place in the family of God is not earned by us. 
It's not earned by us. We have nothing that we can prove to God. Do you get that? You have nothing that you can prove to God. Why? Because Jesus proved it all. Jesus earned it all and he gives it to us. He gives us his life. So what you prove to God is what Jesus has put on you. And that's the younger brother. Let's look at the older brother. Sometimes he's the ignored brother. You think about what it says in your Bible. The title says the prodigal son. And so we think about this dude that screwed up his life, right? Because his sin is really bad. Here's a dude that was drinking and partying and sleeping with prostitutes. And sometimes we go, oh, we can't be that far from God. If you're broken off in your sin, God's right there. And that's true. And then there's some people sitting in the church saying, amen, amen, praise God. Praise God, I'm not like that. Praise God, I've been to church my entire life. I don't curse. I don't sleep with prostitutes. I never get wasted. I live a good life. And then we forget about the older brother. Because remember who Jesus was talking to. The sinners and tax collectors was who he was trying to talk to. But the Pharisees and the scribes were the ones that were grumbling. They were the ones that were causing all the commotion. So he tells the Pharisees about the father's love, passionate, furious love for the younger brother, which they would say is for those sinners and tax collectors. And now all of a sudden Jesus brings these, this older brother into the story. And Jesus brings the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious leaders into this story, but it's the same pattern. You see sin, you see self-justification, you see grace. Look at verse 25. The older son was in the field, and as he came near the house, he heard music and dancing, and he summoned up one of his servants, questioning what these things meant. And his, the servant told him, your brother is here. Your father has slaughtered the fattened cow because he, was, he has him back safe and sound. What's the sin of the older brother? It's the sin of legalism. He hears commotion going on. He hears a celebration happening. He hears all of this from a distance. He's out in the field working, and he returns home, and he's like, what's happening here? And the servants come in and say, oh, we're having a party tonight. Younger brother has come back. He's here. We're going to have a fattened cow. We're going to really celebrate. We are going to party tonight. See, for the older brother, we're going to find out in a moment, he's comparing himself to the younger brother. And he compared to the younger brother, he'd been pretty good. Compared to the younger brother, he proved his worth. He proved that he belongs in this family. He proved that this is where he belonged by doing all the right things that the younger brother didn't. See, legalism, friends, is a living a life where your worth is about what you've done. Legalists have a list. Legalists have a portfolio. All the things that they've done, all the things they've accomplished, that's their identity. And legalists will judge themselves based on the actions of other people. I'm not as bad as that person. I don't do that. I'm really good. Because in reality, it doesn't matter if you go to church every day and you've heard the message of grace a million times. The truth is we can be legalists. Because you could always find someone that's worse than you in your eyes. Well, I didn't kill anyone. Well, I didn't kill multiple people. Well, I'm not really a serial killer, so um, I'm not that bad. But that means that your world is shaped by how you measure up to other people. It's built on how many more stars you have next to your name than the person next to you. See, the older brother's world just got rocked. He had in his mind pretty good since he, he had it in his mind pretty good since the younger brother left. I'm working hard. He's out there squandering his money, but I'm being faithful to dad. I'm definitely the favorite son of my dad now. He's not even in the family anymore. He's taken his stuff and he's gone. We don't even have to worry about him. Now it's just me and dad and everything's good. And you know, if he ever returned, you know what dad will do? Dad's not going to take treat him well. He worked and he worked and he worked to prove that he was in the family and he believes that he proved himself compared to his younger brother. I've done better. I deserve more. I deserve to be treated like a son more than he does. See, unlike the younger brother who had broken this, that led to this make-it-up attitude, legalism will lead to a, hey, I got cheated attitude. I got cheated. You know, I was thinking about this and thinking about the illustration I could use and give you an illustration from my own life that I struggled with. And 
sometimes still struggle with, even though God has been gracious and amazing to me many, many times. If you know how this church started, you know that it was birthed out of a lot of pain and a lot of rejection and a lot of slander that was done by people in a community that said lies about me and ultimately forced us to be put in a situation where we were forced out of a church community that we loved dearly. Now, 10 years later, I can look back and say, you know what the enemy meant for evil, God intended for good. But there was a season. Now, there was years where I was angry and disappointed at God. I made statements like, God, there aren't a lot of second-gen Indians going to seminary. I'm a handful of one of them, and I go back to the Indian church to serve, and this is the thanks I get. I did all the right things. I stayed away from drugs. I went to seminary. I did mission trips. I said yes to be in ministry, and this is what I get. I see that these people that are there making false accusations and lying about me, they're not struggling. They're doing just fine. They're doing okay. God, this isn't fair. They're not experiencing pain and hardship. This is not what I deserve, God. And they deserve a lot worse than what they're actually getting right now. Look at all that I've done for you, and this is what I get. Being honest with my struggles. See, I can get where the older brother is coming from. I'm not justifying it. It's sin. But I've been there with that I've been cheated attitude. You see how he responds to the father in verse 28? He gets angry. He doesn't want to go in. And so his father comes out, pleads with him, and he replies to his father, look, I've been slaving many years for you, slaving many years for you. I never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. And when this son of yours comes, he's devoured your assets with prostitutes. You slaughtered the fattened cow calf for him. The younger brother was like, I've got to prove my worth. I've got to make it up. But the older brother was like, I've proven my worth. I've done all this stuff for you. Why am I not being blessed? Why am I not being taken care of? Why are you not blessing me? See, his, dad, his response to his dad reveals a lot. He never saw his work as one out of joy and thankfulness for his dad. He never saw his work as one out of love for his dad. It was this joyless duty. He saw himself as a servant, not as a son. See, when we feel that we have to prove our life, when we have to prove ourselves to God, what we're going to do is we're going to live this life out of joyless duty. The older brother saw that obedience was tied or connected to blessing. See, when we see our place in God's kingdom is tied with our works, and we also tie good things that happen to us as coming from, oh, maybe this was a good week in the Bible or a good week in prayer, and this is why I'm being blessed. We're on the flip side. If something bad happens, we'll make statements like, maybe it's because I didn't pray enough. Maybe it's because I didn't really read the Bible enough this week. Maybe it's because... There's a sin that I did and I don't even realize it. What did I do? And now there's consequences for my sin. And sometimes we think that God's blessings in our lives or lack of God's blessings in our lives is because we messed up. And so I'm going to earn God's blessings by working really, really hard. I'm going to be perfectly obedient. I'm going to do everything God tells me. I'm going to, I'm going to have perfectly awesome godly children because I'll pray over them every night. I'll read the Bible to them. I'll love my wife as Christ loved the church. I'll, as long as I do that, then my children will be perfect and God will bless me and God will bless my generation. That God owes me this. God owes me this. And then we'll look at others and we'll say, I know they don't work as hard as they do. I know they don't give as much as I do. I know they don't serve as much as I do. I know they don't go to church as much as I do. And yet my kids are struggling, but their kids are doing well. They're far from God. God, you owe me better. See, self-righteousness, friends, leads to an entitlement attitude toward God. Look at where the brother puts himself. He looks at his brother, he looks at his dad and says, your son. He doesn't say my brother. He says your son. Now, I get it. Sometimes when my son over there is acting up, I'll look at my wife and say, that's your son, right? <laughs> um, but that's not what the older brother is doing here. What he's saying is like, no, I'm not even part of this family anymore. You can have you and your son, and I'm out. Your son. He spent it all. 
I didn't do anything wrong. I've never disobeyed. And I can't even have a young goat to party with. And you're going to go kill the fattened cow for him? You know what I earned? You know what is due to me? I worked hard, and you're going to reward him over there? He's your son. See, for this older brother, his place was never in the position of a son. It was always the position of a servant. The two sons had two different sins against the father. They also had different responses to the father. But I want you to notice what remained constant was the father's response. His grace, his love. Verse 31. Son, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead, is alive again. He is lost and is found. Remember, his older brother was angry, refused to go in, and the father comes out and treats him. You notice the younger brother walking down the road, head down, reciting the script, and the father runs to him. You know the father's position in both of these scenes? He doesn't sit and wait for us. But in both of these scenes, he goes out to them. He doesn't say, oh, you're going to be like that? Well, you, you know what? You stay out there. We're going to enjoy the fat and cow ourselves. You, you want to have that attitude? You're not going to be a part of us. You, you don't have to enjoy it. The father doesn't say that. He goes to him. He goes, he says he went to the younger son. He goes to the older son. See, I think sometimes in our fight against legalism, we take it too far because we become legalists against the legalists. Well, they're really far from God. There's no hope for them. And the father goes to both. The father goes to both in this story. Jesus, remember who he's talking to? He says, the father, Pharisees, he's coming for you as well. To come and celebrate the kingdom of God. Would you join us in the celebration of what God's doing? That's a different response than what you would expect. But that means that grace and God's love is bigger than what you had ever thought. And he's saying to the Pharisees, come in. Celebrate with us. Rejoice with us. This is what he's telling the Pharisees and the scribe. Come in. The story of the younger brother is that he hoped to be treated like a servant. And the older brother thought himself as nothing but an obedient servant. And the father wants to see both of them to see that they are not servants, but they are beloved sons. They are beloved sons. That says, I've always been yours. Your obedience never gained you anything. It never lost you anything. It's always been yours because you're my son. Your place in my family has nothing to do with what you did or didn't do. You are my son. It has always been yours. And even after the older brother has spoken to him in the way he did, the father is saying, you are my son. You always had the privileges of the son. What do you learn from the older brother? Three things. Legalism will produce a life of duty and not joy. Your identity will not be in God's love, his steadfast love, amazing grace towards you. Your identity will be in what you can do and what others around you do to make sure you're a little bit taller than them. Legalism will produce a life of duty and not joy. Number two, legalism is a sneaky sin. Why is this story called the prodigal son? Because that's the obvious sin. That's the one, like, man, that dude was really sinful and crazy. But legalism is a sneaky sin. That sense of entitlement, pride, self-righteous descent grows over time, and it's sneaky with how it catches up to us. It's usually not exposed until we're angry that we've been, because we feel like we've been robbed or cheated. And number three, legalism will grow pride. It will harden your hearts. And it will actually draw you farther from God, at least in our hearts. The sneakiest part about this sin is that it will make our hearts harden toward the grace of God because we often will not see any sin in us because we're always comparing ourselves to other people. The guy that's broken by his pornography addiction, he's broken by it. He sees it. The dude that's proud because he's never struggled against that sin, he doesn't see it. But you know what he's dealing with? 
pride, sin, and they're both sinful. They're both dishonoring God. Think about the Gospels. The guy that saw the story, his brokenness, was the ones that Jesus was hanging out with. The guys that lived their lives trying to prove their worth to God, the legalists, were the ones always on the outside of the party grumbling, always on the outside angry. These are the ones that Jesus went after the most, the ones that Jesus would say, you're far, but you don't know. Would you come close? The ones that John the Baptist would call you brutal vipers. Read the gospel. See who Jesus is harder on because that's a more dangerous sin because it gives you this false sense of security to say, I'm okay. I'm fine. There's nothing wrong with me. This is the message that Jesus wants the Pharisees to see, to accept God's grace, to be humbled by the fact that we are in this not because of anything we've done, but simply because of the grace and kindness and mercy of God. He's pleading through the story with the Pharisees, would you come in? Would you celebrate God's kingdom? Would you celebrate God's grace? But they couldn't because it's bigger than they thought. Here's the thing. Jesus leaves the story hanging. You notice that? We don't know what happens. We're going, well, what happened? Did the older boy go in? Did he go party? Did he leave? That's not the point. This isn't actually a real story, but Jesus' point in the story is real. He's saying, Pharisees, what are you going to do? Legalists, what are you going to do? Older brother, what are you going to do? Younger brother, do you see yourself in the story? Younger brother, do you see yourself in the family? Younger brother, do you see that you don't have to make it up, that God is here, you are never far from him. He is running after you. He is pursuing you. Legalist, do you see that it's a time to celebrate God's grace, that you can come in? Jesus leaves it. He leaves it hanging. He leaves it hanging for us. See, the truth is we bounce back and forth. Some days we're like the younger brother. Some days we're like the older brother. We bounce back and forth, on and off. I was a younger brother. I ran. I ran. And God took a hold of me in my junior year of high school, and I encountered his grace and his love. And here's the thing. As soon as you start forgetting about that, it's finished. You're saved by grace and grace alone, not by your works. But as soon as you start going, I used to be there, but now I'm saved. I'm cleaning up my life. I don't curse as much. I don't do this. I go to church every day. I memorize scripture. And all of a sudden, you begin to start looking like the older brother. Look what I'm doing for you, God. Look well, how amazing I am. Look at all these sacrifices I'm making for you. I'm showing you my place in the kingdom. Look what I've done here. And you start slowly moving from the position of the younger brother to the position of the older brother, saying, God, you've got to bless me because I deserve it. And so we bounce back and forth. So don't just sit here and think, well, I'm the old... I'm just the older brother. I'm just the younger brother. We bounce. Our hearts are wicked on our own. So maybe you're here this morning and you're far from God. You think that you have to make it up to God. You think that God's blessings in your life is dependent on your, on your performance. Or maybe you're here and you're like, man, I have sympathy for the older brother. You wouldn't actually say that. But you're like, I get it. I get that. Let me give you the... Let me give you the answer as we close. You know what's the answer to both the sin of license and the sin of legalism? The answer is the other brother. Do you see the other brother in this story? Do you see the other brother? He's the one that's telling the story. The true older brother. Jesus. See, back in that day, it would have been the older brother's responsibility to go chase the younger brother. It would have been the older brother's responsibility in that day to say, hey, you're making a fool of yourself. You're destroying our family name. Come back. It was the older brother's responsibility. Do you know what the true older brother did? He came and he sought us in our mess. As the older brother in the story, Jesus tells, he says, I'm the true older brother. I came to you in your mess. Do you realize in this story, remember, the younger brother's inheritance is gone. The fattened cow is expensive. The robe, the rings, they're expensive. 
Whose inheritance is that? It's the older brother's. The father is taking the older brother's stuff and giving it to the younger brother. The older brother's not dumb. He's like, wait a minute, that's mine. You're celebrating the younger brother's return with everything that's rightfully mine. He already took his stuff. Jesus, our older brother, came and he lived. The Bible says he didn't count equality with God as something to be grasped. He humbled himself. He died on the cross. He was slaughtered on the cross in our place so that we could partake in his inheritance in the inheritance of Jesus, so that we can partake in his inheritance by being adopted into his family, by being brought into the family of God. And Hebrews 2 tells us that Jesus, friends, is not ashamed to call you and I brothers. He's not ashamed. Listen to these words from 1 Peter. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Friends, God the Father is in constant pursuit of you through God the Son, and he will not stop his pursuit for you. See, that's the story of the prodigal son. The older brother comes and gets us with his life. The father has been in pursuit since the fall. See, if you want the story of the scripture, this is what God is saying. I had you. I lost you. I'm going to get you back. I had you. I lost you. I'm going to get you back. See, that's the story of scripture and the story of this parable. God's grace and our rest is the constant emphasis of scriptures. It's the constant referring to the God's unmerited grace toward us. How it must lift our head and in our shame and humble us in our pride. God is gracious for us when we know we cannot do feel burdened to make it up to him. We understand God's grace more and more when we're resting and not being vindicated by our works. That we can worship And we can live knowing that there's nothing we could do to win God's approval. Jesus died in our place. Here's the thing. Because the older brother can grow in us and say, I trust Jesus as my Savior. And we can start saying things like, Jesus has given us a clean slate, a a fresh slate. He's given you a clean slate. It's a start over. But friends, that's not true. Jesus doesn't give you a fresh slate. He doesn't. He doesn't give you a clean slate. He gives you his slate. And his slate is clean. See, if he gave you a fresh slate, if he gave you a clean slate, it's going to get dirty again. If he gives you his slate, It's perfect. So the father, when he looks at you, doesn't see how fresh or clean your slate is. He sees Jesus' slate, not a clean slate, not a fresh slate, but the slate of Jesus. So you can rest in that. Older brother, come and celebrate this. Younger brother, he's right there, not because of you, but because of Jesus. And friends, there's only one thing that God wants you to do. Simply have faith in his son. Everything else will flow from that. Everything else. Everything else will flow from knowing Jesus, from trusting Jesus, our older brother, seeing the love of the Father through our older brother, seeing that we were never too far, and watching our hearts that we can never get closer on our own. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the older brother coming after us, the true older brother. We're about to come to the table. This table is a reminder to us, friends, there is nothing we could have done to be able to say, Father. And while we were yet in our sin, God sent Jesus to us to die on our behalf, to take the penalty of our sins so that we could be forgiven, so that this morning, if you are a follower of Jesus in this room, you can say boldly and you can say with confidence, Abba, Father, knowing that he will hear you.
So would you come this morning, would you examine your heart this morning? If you're trying to prove your worth to God, would you realize that there's nothing you could do to make God love you more? There's nothing you could do to make God love you less. You are family. If you're a legalist here this morning and you don't see it and you are comparing yourself to other people, would you repent and acknowledge that it is not because of how good you are or anything that God loves you. It is purely his grace and his kindness and his mercy. And if you are a legalist, would you repent because you need to repent because otherwise you will live in this sin and it will make you miserable. It will make you feel like you deserve something. When it doesn't go your way, you will get angry at God. And friends, don't let that ruin your life. It is purely his grace. It is purely his kindness. When we come to the table, this table is for people who have put their faith in Jesus. This table is for those who have acknowledged and said, Jesus, you are my savior. I cannot come to you any other way, so I put my faith in you. If you're not a follower of Jesus this morning, can I invite you, before you leave this morning, would you surrender your life to Jesus? You're not here by accident this morning. You were brought here because God wanted you here, because God was drawing you here. So this morning, if you don't do anything else, if you don't hear anything else, would you hear these words? God loves you. God knows you. God wants to be in relationship with you. And so if you need someone to pray with you this morning, can I invite you? There's some folks that are standing in the back that would love to pray with you this morning. Would you, would you go and pray with them? If you need prayer for anything this morning, there's some folks back there. Would you go? Would you pray with them? And then would you spend some time in prayer before you come to communion this morning? The way we do communion here at Loft is we allow you to meditate on the words for a little bit and allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you. And then whenever you're ready, you're welcome to come down the middle aisles, grab the elements, and go back to your seat or spend some time with God. Would you allow the Holy Spirit to convict you of legalism? Would you allow the Holy Spirit to convict you of, of trying to prove your worth to God? So this morning, would you come? Would you come with brokenness and say, God, there's nothing in my hand I bring simply to the cross and claim it? Would you come laying all of your works and all of your legalism down and saying, God, would you help me to understand your grace more and more this morning? Father, I thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this powerful story. Thank you for your love. May we sit in that as a church. May we not be a church where people, we think they're okay. I've got Jesus. Now I've got a flush straight slate and I can do all these good works. But may we say, all I have is Jesus and that's all I need. And may we live in light of that. May we rest and worship in light of that. May we go on mission in light of that. May we invite people into our homes in light of that, not to gain points in heaven, not to gain favor, but to share this amazing trueness that we, we get to be part of a celebration that gets bigger and bigger and bigger. We see the celebration and revelation of every tongue, every tribe, every nation worshiping. May we be in awe. May we be excited for that day. May our own sense of self-justification, may our own sins of license be crucified, be mortified. May we rest in the words of Jesus, it's finished. Thank you for making us a part of your family. Thank you that you love us because of your love. You have saved us through your son, Jesus. There is nothing more than we could prove. You freed us from the burden of trying to prove our worth to you to feel justified by what we've done or what we've said. So we can let go of all control and rest in greatness. We can find our rest and our identity in your gloriousness, that we don't have to fear others, that we can worship you because you are good, that we can be satisfied in that, not look elsewhere. It's all covered in your grace. We pray this in Jesus' name.